Malcontent, how are you doing? Welcome to the Malcontent Mentango. We're glad that you uh, could join us here this uh, evening. We are in Seattle, Washington. We are broadcasting live and we are at the march uh, to show solidarity with the for Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake was the individual that was shot in the back in Kenosha by the police department seven times, um, is now paralyzed uh, and in hospital. Uh, there's an ongoing police investigation and, and of course all of the unrest that happened in uh, Kenosha after that. Nikki Blake, cousin, who uh, is uh, from Auburn, Washington, is here uh, and she will be speaking very, very shortly on uh, what's going on and then there will be a march there is a number of events that are going on right now activism events going on in the seattle area that's nikki talking So while we're taking a couple of, well, it looks actually like we're going to get started here. because he was mad at me not having a message of hope any longer. He said, Mom, 
If you tell the kids you have no hope, they'll have no hope. They have to have hope, so I'm your hope. So he said, give me the microphone when you're done so that I can give people some hope. And he had written a poem. He told, gave a poem about hope. We were really excited. We went out to lunch with a friend. And when we were uh, eating, we figured we'd look at the comments to see what happened. You know, we were really excited. Now, there were, there were good comments. But you know how the human brain works. It focuses on the bad comments. Elliot, who's not a political kid, who just came out to support his first cousin, who wrote a poem that had nothing but hope in it for the future, because he introduced himself as a trans man, the violence that came was overwhelming. No mother wants their kid to have to read that, right? People threaten to kick him in his balls. He doesn't have any balls. It's like you guys are so ignorant. You hate trans people, but you don't know what they are. It's so very, very sad. I was in bed for a day because people said such horrible things about me that I am a, oh, let me think, crazy racist oh crazy vile racist right and so um when i went to bed crying i guess those were the words that were running through my head that i was a crazy vile racist when i woke up in the morning the first thoughts i had in my mind was that i was a crazy vile racist and i don't i just don't understand of you that were at city hall heard me say don't hate our white allies. They're trying to help us. If you are white and you're scared because your black friends are angry, you have to cope with that. If you're black and you're mad at our white allies, you're wrong at the wrong. You're mad at the wrong people. Everybody from um, everything that was said was from I was fat. I was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, they couldn't understand what I, they couldn't understand, they were distracted from my message because my mask was too colorful. They were distracted from my me message because my eyeglasses were too colorful. It would seem to me that racist bigots just don't like color, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know why conservatives want everything to be gray, black, brown, neutral colors. I don't know why conservatives need for us to be a certain way so that we can be electable. Why do we have to recreate Obama Trump to be acceptable to white people is my question. We're never going to find another Obama. You couldn't find one. Y'all ain't got no Obamas. He's the first black Harvard Law Journal president. There's no other first like him. We can't find a black who's going to willing anymore not to ever say that they were black, not to acknowledge their own blackness because that keeps you whites comfortable. It's not going to happen. We'd like to have another Obama, but there is no more. He was the cream of any crop. Not the cream of the black crop, the cream of any crop. I need to have everybody look to the person to the left and look to the people to the right and know that if we are here, look to the people in the front and the back. If you're here with these people, they're our people. They are ours. This man, he's ours. He's in our team. This moment, she's ours. <laughs> she's ours. <laughs>
because <laughs> she's on our team. Sometimes our team doesn't look like you'd expect them to look. And I want you to remember that because we're all on the same team. It's not us versus each other. We need to figure out, smarter people than me need to figure out, we need to figure out how come there can be a heritage foundation, but our wealthy Democrats don't get together and have a foundation where we fund things that need to get done on the left. Why is it that the press never listens to the left, left of center Democrats? I, have, I haven't seen a left of center Democrat on TV in a real long time, but I know we get things done when we need to. Why don't they ask us? Why don't they put out the call to us? Why don't we have a think tank that says, look, nothing's ever been done. The lawyers tell us it's because you can't write a statute against racism. Let's get a think tank together. Let's get some of that Hollywood money together and figure out how to really, aside from, we've been marching since 1964. I know I've been marching since I was in utero. That was 65. This gentleman probably marched before then, right? We've been marching for a long time. If marching resolves things, we wouldn't have a problem, right? Okay, we've got to figure out, put some real money into it. It's not legislation. It's already illegal. So what do we do? What do we do? When a lot of you two, are y'all too young to know, but defund the police didn't always have a name. But it's been around. The thought has been around for a long time. I was a child welfare lawyer for many years here in Seattle. Child welfare lawyers represent foster children and the people who are arguing over custody of them. As a child welfare lawyer, way back to Chicago, when I, the year I graduated as a law clerk um, for the People's Law Office in, in Chicago, way back in 91, we used to talk about what if we took some money from the criminal justice pot or the prison system and just figured out how to make foster kids lives better right there's a kid out there he wants to play the play the violin let's take some of this money and get that young artist some art supplies let's take the kid who's the next stem the next biologist the one who's going to save us from the bees dying let's take some money from the criminal justice pot the prison pot and then maybe we'll end up not needing that money because the kids aren't going to be thoughts because they have hope they have dreams let's take some money from the prison system and put it into the place where kids who have been in multi-generational um, social social poverty, meaning to say maybe their grandmother was in, had welfare, their mother had welfare, and now they're looking to apply for welfare themselves. Let's figure how to keep these families together and solid. Why do we have to bust them up? Why do we have to send a kid to foster care all the time? Why can't we figure out how to keep families together so at the end there won't need to be a, a thriving, going to future be private uh, criminal uh, uh, prison system? Why can't we give it to the families so the families don't break in the first place and non-broken families don't have criminal elements, right? Let's keep those families together. Does anybody agree with that? I'd also like to say that um, here, police, police racism is a subcomponent of general racism, right? And so if a police bigot <laughs> doesn't come from nowhere, Mark Sherman didn't come from nowhere, people have families that are bigots, right? They teach their children to be bigots, then some of those people go into the police force. Racism in America is something that we have to figure out how to deal with all together. All of us together. And we can't just say we're going to deal with racism in Seattle. If there's a call somewhere else, you got to go somewhere else. Because we need for everybody to know. We're, if I live in Kenosha, which is a small town, I need for people in Seattle to show their support. 
If I live in Kenosha, I need for people in LA to show their support, people in Chicago to show their support, people in New York to show their support, people in Miami to show their support. That's why every time you're here, I want you to come out. I want you to call. If you can't call, tell the organizers. I, I can send over punch. I can do something for you. Real things. We need to figure out real ways. If you're not protesting yourself, figure out a way you can support a protester. Um, so that is an idea. I also want you to think of the idea that if you are... Caucasian. I want you to stop letting your kids be around that dick in your family, right? The guy, the one guy who makes everybody uncomfortable at Christmas, crazy Uncle Charlie talking about the niggers, the kikes, the this, the that, the chinks. He can't be in your family anymore. It's end of the line for crazy Uncle Charlie. If it's your wife's family and she won't, she, she's got, you got to divorce her. It's the end of the line for crazy Uncle Charlie. If it's your family, you have to be the one to tell Crazy Uncle Charlie to get out. It's the end of the line for Crazy Uncle Charlie. Because Crazy Uncle Charlie's not at my house on Thanksgiving. He wouldn't be, right? Crazy Uncle Charlie's in, yup. It's not true. American families are very complicated sometimes. Really, they are. I mean, one of my best, former best friends was at my house one time. She brought me a hostess present white lady, a farmer's wife, not too far from the farm I, uh, the farmland I live in. So she came over, she brought me a hostess gift, and she says, Nikki, how come you can use the N-word, but I cannot use the N-word? And I said to myself, my Lord, you have black grandchildren. That's why. What are you thinking about? I don't know what America's thinking about anymore. How am I the bigot when I tell people to get together, all races, and figure out this problem? How do I become the bigot? It's projection. That's why. It's projection. We need for this to stop. We need to figure out for how it to stop. We don't have, we need for some of our moneyed intellectuals here in Seattle, you know who they are, we'll start a letter writing campaign, right? We need a heritage foundation. We've needed it forever. I've been trying to get the wealthy in Seattle, the wealthy in King County together to figure out why aren't, why, why are the people so disregarded? Why is it that what the people want doesn't seem to make it into the party platter? platform. Like, what? <laughs> 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 Are there appetizers? <laughs> it's called capitalism. <laughs> Why is it that the people don't listen? Why is it that the parties don't listen to what we want? Why is it that their party listens to what they want? But we're saying, look, in this police violence, it's easy. Tell us how to do it. Let's have the best minds and the most money in America get together and sit down and figure it out. It never gets figured out. It never gets figured out. I can't figure it out. Everybody needs to get together and figure it out together. I do want to have a moment of silence. My father was a um, Methodist minister. And then we're going to carry on. I'm going to ask everybody to say a few words if they want to. but. And I'll have some closing remarks, um, but we're not going to stay here all night long. I want us to have a moment of silence, and I'm going to have some guided meditation. But for the first few seconds, I'll talk about my father. Let's close our eyes. And let's think what it would be like to be a black man driving in a white neighborhood. Your tire's flat. You gotta get out of the car. Your favorite son, who's eight years old, is in the back seat of the car. You 
go and open your trunk. You close your trunk. You get the jack. Start jack. Please pull over. You see a mine. You're happy, right? You've got a problem. You need some help. The police ask you your name. They ask you for your driver's license. And before you know it, you're on the ground. Your baby's in the backseat of the car. Think, 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 think. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? You don't want your baby to see you on the ground. A father doesn't want his baby, who still thinks he's Superman, because he's only eight years old, I'm on the ground, right? Are you frantic? Are you scared? What's the feeling? What's the feeling that you're feeling? You're eating gravel and your baby's in the backseat of the car. They don't know he's there yet. What's the feeling? What does your chest feel like? What does your stomach feel like? I need to be quiet and let you sit in those feelings for a few minutes. Open your eyes. Did you do this? Did you do the meditation? What was the feeling that you felt? I guess just tired, exhausted. Uh, it seems like nothing ever changes. And, you know, I noticed a lot of people aren't out here tonight. And I was talking to someone else about this. People only seem to come out here when it's trending. And what a shame because nothing has really changed. It's the same thing. And it really, you know, it's so painful to watch. And I, and I don't blame them. I really don't blame them. Seattle had the most passionate George Floyd protest movement of any city in the nation. I want you guys to give yourselves an applause. It's just hard to keep coming back. Keep coming back. Are we going to be coming back next year? Five years from now? Ten years from now? They want us to keep coming back. Keep coming back. I'm going to leave you in Victoria Poncho's hands for now. Uh, I'm going to say a few things about police around the nation that I know about. I have personally, and I'm, I'm sorry folks, but it's true, I've only had good experiences with the Seattle Police Department. However, I, I um, retired from the law before Trayvon died or around about the time Trayvon died. And one of the things I think is that if you wear a suit, you're considered one of the good blacks, right? So I wore a suit. I wore Italian suit to work every day. And so I think maybe a lot of it missed me. On the other hand, there are bad police stations and there are bad police stations. I think that at the end of some of the protesting stages that we're going to have to reach out to our police and, and figure out how none of the worst stuff happens here anymore because we're going to act locally and think globally on all of this. I'm from Auburn, Washington. We're having some real bad problems, as you've read in the newspaper about our police, right? Yeah. But there's only a statute, and the first police officer apparently is being tried under that statute right now. So, yeah. yeah. We'll see how that works out. Um, racism in, uh, you guys might think you're seeing racism, but you don't know the racism because you don't live in South King County. I live in Auburn, Washington.
Yeah. I have been, I will tell you, I haven't felt, it's a quantitative and qualitative difference in the feeling of the biggest that are there since, my, since 2016. So, uh, I've been in a really nice neighborhood since my kid was born in the year that we moved in 2019 on the hill in Auburn. It's amazing how my neighbors within walking distance have on me. I, I, it's been shocking to me. I don't understand how it happened so fast. I believe that it used to be considered uh, impolite to um, voice your racism to your neighbors who live in the country down the road from you. I believe it is no longer impolite to voice your racism. I've lost 65 pounds over the last many years, too many, it's a deal. <laughs> but I did it by hiking through my neighborhood. Hiking through my neighborhood. I just have a 3.2 mile route. I've, been wa I've walked past the same houses thousands of times since my kid was a baby. 15 years it took me to lose 65 pounds. Okay, I said it. It's embarrassing. But for 15 years then, I've been walking this 3.2 mile track, sometimes uh, once a day, sometimes twice, sometimes three times a day. I was, I was on Weight Watchers magazine because they could not believe I'd walked from Auburn to Kent and back again, and that's how I got to the meeting. They know I'm there, they've been seeing me for 15 years. Now all of a sudden I'm having problems. One of my Lee Hill neighbors threatened to release their uh, pit bull on me. What do you think I was doing? I'm 54 years old and unfit. Let me tell you what I was doing. They have a butterfly bush and it part of it hangs over onto the public side of the road. I was smelling one of their blossoms and they threatened to release their pit bull on me. Call me if you want to know who they are. Um, Auburn, Washington. Auburn, Washington cops. Auburn, Washington. One day, three weeks ago, and they apparently don't care. They're not doing anything. One day, three weeks ago, I rolled out without some stuff I left at the store, right? <laughs> my stuff. So I took about half of my stuff and left, and I don't know, maybe I left it on the conveyor belt or something. Um, 10 foot, 10 foot lightning cord for my Apple phone and some other electronics, some sheets, and it all adds up to $75 or so. I go home, I get home, call them up. The clerk, there's only two, because I just passed by him, I even can see her face. The clerk says, oh, she said, where did you get him? Just like I said it now. I said, humma, humma this, humma, humma that, humma this, and she said, what about your peas? And I laughed. Because of course I'm thinking about the high ticket items, right? Not some snap peas. I had two big three pound bags of snap peas. I said, oh my God, they're snap peas. So that really is my groceries, right? She's got stuff I had forgotten about. And she, I said, leave it there. I'll be, she said, I need to the peas. I said, no, 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 I'll be bad tomorrow. There are peas in the truth is. I didn't care if those peas died. I knew if they had to go back to the refrigerator, it would take long. So I said, just leave them up front. I get in the next day. I was hoping to get there at 9, get there at 10, right? Where's my stuff? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Every day for two weeks after that, I talked to five different managers. I said, ma'am, I do not understand. That. I still haven't got my stuff. No one's called me. I've called corporate. I've called managers there. Fred Meyer Auburn, if you can avoid shopping at Fred Meyer until they apologize to me for treating me like a N-word, I would appreciate it. Fred Meyer doesn't care about the fact that I've given high-end cocktail parties as a litigator for years on Lee Hill, that I've been there since my kid was a baby and she's, uh, he's a freshman in college. They don't care. I am certain that if I didn't look like this, 
they would have apologized and gave me my stuff back. They, they told me, sue. So I'm going to have to sue in small claims court for $75. I've been shopping there since my kid was a baby. He's 20 years old. It's ridiculous. The racism that's coming out in South King County, Washington, is unbelievable. They let me know every day they don't want me there. I'm too obstinate to leave my home because it's nice. I shut them down and I go into the backyard. But it's tough. I don't know. Do you, have you ever had anything like that happen to you? Okay, I didn't think so. My friend has had problems with the uh, police in Auburn. I'm going to let her tell her story. And if there's anybody here who's actually had a police incident, I want you to step forward. If there's anything anybody wants to say about Jake, my family, my father, if there are any young people who want to talk about the history of the civil rights movement, I'm going to sit here for a while. I worked for the People's Law Office in Chicago. I was there when they got an $8 million verdict when the last Black Panther was shot in the back. His um, wife got $8 million verdict. I was there. I worked on it. I know the history. I know the history. I was in my mother's belly when Martin Luther King Jr. came to my, my town twice to speak to us. I was two years old when my father integrated our school district so I didn't have to go to a Jim Crow school. My family thinks they might have finally messed with the wrong family. They messed with Reverend Jacob S. Blake Jr.'s family. There are so many Jacob Blakes in my family, I think they think it's, it's going to be good luck if they call their kid Jake Blake. It's because my dad was Jake Blake and he changed the world. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story. Nikki, I appreciate that. I live in Auburn. I grew up in Auburn as a queer, <coughs> indigenous Chicana woman. It was really hard. Um, the racism is incredibly painful there, as is the homophobia. <coughs> On May 13th of 2018, I was dancing um, because I was grieving over somebody who was very close to me and just passed away. And to deal with my pain, I wanted to put it into something positive. So I sang that night and I danced that night. There was a woman who danced with me. She danced rather provocatively, but I was grieving and I just wanted to feel anything but pain. So she dances with me. She takes my phone to put my phone number in it, walks me over to the bar where her and her friends are. And her military husband comes and tells me to get off his women. Mind you, I wasn't on her. I was soon circled by his friends, so I pushed my way past him and I went down the stairs and outside. I only lived a few blocks, so I, I, I walked there, and I go to give my friend a hug in the parking lot. She gets in her car, and I'm approached by an officer, and right behind him is another officer. He says, ma'am in the blue jacket, I recognize this officer when he laughs. He was an officer who I saw harassing some homeless individuals, taunting them, saying, there's no way you can be sober. So sober. You're walking like this, you look like this, you're acting like this. You're trying to tell me you go to meetings and you're sober? <clears throat> that night, which was only a few weeks before, I told Officer Nunn, I fear you. I fear your soul and the modality in which you walk this earth. I don't feel this other officers around you. I fear you, they're just following your lead. And so on me, On May 14th, he approaches me. I put my hands up so that he knows that I'm willing to be respectful and compliant. And I say, am I under arrest or am I free to go? The officer laughs, <laughs> and he swings me to the ground. As he's forcing me to the ground in an arm brace, he has full control over my body and he's screaming at me to quit resisting. 
My head slams to the ground, and the second officer that was just moments behind him jumps on top of me, and I have two grown men, very large men, on top of me, and they're pressing on the back of my lungs here, and very peculiar parts that make it really hard for your lungs to expand. And when I see these videos of these individuals who lose their lives, we focus on the hands, but it's also the knees. When they're kneeling on that space, they don't allow the, the, the necessary space for your diaphragm to expand your ribcage, and that's how they keep you from getting air in. They use their fists on both sides of my neck to strangle me, and I couldn't get air in, and I couldn't get air out. And the moment that I got air out, it was like all my air came out. So I had to be careful. I did a body check. Nope, I'm not resisting. Body's not resisting. I had one breath left, and I had to think to myself, do I hold it to hold on to my consciousness, or do I expel it to try to reach out for help? And so I yelled as much as I could, I'm not resisting, and that was it. I just remember seeing this, I think it was a street light, and I felt really calm, and everything that led up to how I came to that moment, like went through my eyes, like, I could tell every decision that I made in my lifetime that led me to that decision and all the people that it was gonna impact. And while I was laying there, I was a little angry at myself for a little bit. And I'm like, why can't you just keep your head down, damn it? Why can't you just do what you're told? Why can't you just be silent? And you were quiet instead of standing up. Your little nephews and your little nieces won't have to deal with the traumatic loss of your death. Why can't you just shut up? And then I felt this peace. I was always a person who thought that I would stand and I would want to die standing and lying down. But in that moment, your pre-wired instincts just are driven to survive and I would have rather survived them to a rock. And it was because of society telling me as a brown woman, a queer woman, that my voice doesn't matter, just quiet down, it's all those messaging. If I would have just listened to all the white people all the angry white people, like maybe I would still be here. If I could just placate to them. And so I survived. And I thought about my nieces and my nephews and I never want them to have to make that fucking decision. I never want them to feel like they can die just because they exist. And the reason why I'm out here and the reason why I stick my head out and the reason why I use my voice is so they don't have to live that way. Now they put me in the police car after I gained consciousness and it's only a 10, 15 minute ride from Federal Way to Auburn and it took them 45 minutes. They played a loud fucking recording and it was of a man's voice and it says, it is okay to use race. It is okay to identify subgroups. It is okay to something else, but it is not okay to be a racist prick. They take me out of the car I get put back into the car and now there's loud music turned on and I'm hysterical and I'm trying to tell them how they hurt me and I'm saying I hope that there's camera and that there's audio. I go to the jail, I'm put into this block with all the other cells and the lady in charge of that block asked me, Victoria, are you okay? And I couldn't even realize that I wasn't. Apparently I was just standing in front of a wall and just staring at it. They broke my mind. I didn't get any medical treatment. I get out of jail on Mother's Day. I go to my first court date. They tell me that I'm charged with resisting arrest and assault. I go to my second court date, and before I can get my own discovery, they drop my case like a hot potato. I couldn't even get the damn video from the Safeway parking lot of my own tragic incident because I would have to go through the cops. And I'll have to go through the court. But since my court already closed, that means I have to have the money to get a civil case. And at that time, that's what I thought, but you can also get the, the, the discovery. But 
In the discovery, the police never got that camera. They never got the camera from the parking lot and they deleted there in 30 minutes. These officers are awful and so they got my criminal background, no problem, but I got theirs. The officer none who was involved in my case, he had slipped a message into a superior's message box claiming that he had heard a female officer state that she needed stronger ammunition to deal with Officer Nelson's threat to society. This was in 2014. The reason why he said that he overheard that woman saying that was because that was Officer Hansen. And she was a female that Officer Nunn told her to bring her bikini next time that she went to training. She was an officer who when she went to go report it to our chief of police, he said, you know, you can make a big fuss about it, but I don't think anybody's going to believe you. It might just be better to just keep your head low and get through your training because you're definitely one of our superior officers or higher, and you're going to get your award. So, you know, maybe if you just don't ruffle any feathers, you're going to get these things. I later learned that the mayor saw my dash cam video and she said, Victoria, we must have saw two different things. And I said, Mayor Nancy Bacchus, whatever you saw, the court didn't see because they dropped my case like a hot potato. So what happens when you have a group of guys who come from a segregated land of Auburn where it was whites only, where there's racial tensions and they're out there and they're harassing us sexually. They're harassing us physically. They're killing us and they're intimidating us. And then they come back home and Big Mama Hen, the mayor, gives them an award. What kind of children do you build like that when you award them for violent acts? We need all new staff in the Auburn Police Department and we need our mayor gone. I live today in fear because those officers still feel free to taunt me. They come up on the sidewalk acting like they're going to run me over. They come to the teriyaki place. Oh, there's famous Victoria. Oh, hi, camera lady. There is no peace. And there is no stopping them. How do we get them to stop? How do we get them to stop? I don't know. But what I do know is that I've been locked in my house for two years and it wasn't until all of you started coming out in the streets and changing the awareness that I had the strength to come out. You wanna know why? Because now, if I'm on the street corner and there's some altercation, people are gonna look by. And now, sometimes they even stop and they make sure, and that's even better than relying on just thousands of hundreds of cars blinking by trying to catch a glimpse of the truth. So I want you to remember when you see somebody on the side of the road, especially a person of color, just remember, I know we all got our things that we have to do. Stop. Take out your camera. But we also cannot afford to lose our brothers and sisters in this and become smaller and smaller communities. So just stop for a minute, because I guarantee you, your jobs are more secure than ours. And take a moment. And so I'm going to open this up to anybody who wants to speak, especially if you have an experience. protest back in 2015 up in White Center. My brother was called in where by a bunch of white men. 
These white men threaten me with knives. Oh, I can, oh, I can look at my white mom saying, okay, this is like the usual. This is nothing I'm not used to. She talks about trolls on Twitter. I've been doing that since 2014. There's nothing that anybody can say or do to you that can scare you. Because realistically, if you know what if you know what you're fighting for, if you believe what you're fighting for, you believe Black Lives Matter, then nothing can scare you. Because at the end of the day, you're fighting for we're fighting for, as as the black people are fighting for just for as a, for survival, just to be treated as human beings, just to be treated like, like we're actually a person. You know, we're 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 just asking not to be shot to death. We're asking people like Jake. They didn't have to even take it on Jake Blake. They could even, could, they could even put a shoulder on his, on, his, uh, on, his, on, his, on his shoulder and be like, hey, dude, can you say stop for a second? No, he decided to shoot him sometimes. That makes no damn sense. There's no reason for it to use a force. The way the system is these days, cops are not there to help you. We regards Auburn, Seattle, Kenosha, New York, or St. Louis. They're all the same, all the same system is uphold the whole white supremacy and basically destroy any, any, any uprising the freedom and people that be true like humans. So does anybody else want to speak? I know it's been white people, come on. When you guys try to at least an ally speak? Good point, good point. Well, then, okay. <laughs> Is anyone here as outraged as I am about hearing these stories? Yes. Is it enough? Enough is enough. Chant that with me. Enough is enough. Enough is enough! Enough is enough! This dehumanization that's happening and is getting worse and worse! These stories that we're hearing over and over again! People are saying, what is going to change this? How can we even stop this? And now we've got a fucking fascist regime in the White House. We are facing full-on fascism. From the very top, the Trump regime on down. These mother... Okay, I'm going to try to watch my language. <laughs> After Charlottesville, this is what people need to understand. What people beyond us here need to understand. After Charlottesville, they put away their swastika armbands and their KKK hoods, and they put on MAGA hats, and they started waving their blue lines, their blue lines flags, and now they're Trump flags. And they have been unleashed. Trump cannot be ignored because they are seeking revenge on this beautiful uprising. And we cannot let that go down. There has been horrific oppression. Racism, white supremacy is in the DNA of this country. No one can deny that now. But if we think that it cannot get a lot worse, then we are ignoring the lessons of history. We're ignoring Nazi Germany and the difference between when there were pogroms against Jewish people and horrific oppression and abuse and demonization and no one and many many Jews fled and no one thought that it could get much worse than that and some Jews even came back after a couple years mm -hmm. because it didn't accelerate exactly the way they thought it would and then there were camps, and then there were gas chambers. And do not tell me that this regime is incapable of doing this, because they don't see 
black people as human beings. They do not see LGBTQ people as human beings. We have to unite to stop this from all kinds of perspectives, from all kinds of struggles. The people of the world are looking to us and they're wondering, what are the people in this country going to do about this fucking fascist regime that is also a nuclear threat to the rest of the people of the world and is part of rising fascism all over the world in the most powerful empire in this country? I'm calling on people to come out. There's a growing movement to demand Trump, Pence, out now. On September 5th, this Saturday, nationwide, here in Seattle, Westlake Park at 2 p.m. Come protest with us. Come march with us. And begin 60 days of struggle. What are they telling us? They're going to steal these elections. Mm -hmm. They're going to declare the election invalid if Trump doesn't win. And they want to make whatever Trump says the law. And that is not something we've seen before. That is fascism. Come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you, Nikki, for giving me the chance to make this announcement. And this is about, our struggles cannot be disconnected. This is about whether or not we're going to just protest it or whether or not we're going to stop it and then open up the possibility after this fascist regime is driven out and we don't have to live like this anymore to then open the possibility for our struggles to go forward and for debate to flourish about the way forward and to build a better world where we can all be human fucking beings and where none of us are complicit in the racism and the white supremacy that surrounds us. It has to stop. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to break the fourth frame. Do you want? Do you want to? Um, do I just squeeze? Do you, or? do you want to wipe it down? Do we have uh, a uh, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Oop. Don't hit that button. Like some help? Oh, she's just getting a wipe, but yeah. Do you just, uh, is it just basically on? There's no like trigger button or? Yeah. Okay, got so. it. So. <laughs> <Just kinda laughs> yeah, that'll work. Okay. Okay, so I'm breaking the fourth frame, but, um, uh, you know, Nikki asked for somebody who um, is an ally that's had a negative interaction to come forward, so I'm going to come forward. The year's 2015, the city is Detroit, Michigan. I was there for work. I was there filming a video for a corporation. We went out on a Sunday, on a sunny Sunday afternoon to go shoot some B-roll. That's just like out on the street stuff of Detroit. We were down by the Renaissance Center and the Maritime Sailors Cathedral and the Fraser Fist and the Windsor Tunnel. We're down there shooting video. We're looking like a very professional crew shooting video. And the next thing I know, I can hear a voice. And I turn, and there's two Department of Homeland Security officers there. They both have M16s. They have automatic weapons. One is in low ready. The other one has their finger on the trigger. And they want to demand to see what's on our cameras. And I'm like, I don't understand. And they're like, what are you shooting pictures of? And I just told them what I told you and showed them our film permit. And they demanded to see what was on our cameras again. 
If you live within 100 miles of the borders of the United States, Department of Homeland Security can ignore large pieces of the Fourth Amendment. I don't think a lot of people realize that. So we had to comply. There was nothing on there. And then we were told to leave. To this day, I don't know what that was about, but that was a stunning experience for me as somebody who was gravely concerned when Patriot Act 1 was passed and then going, oh my goodness, when Patriot Act 2 was passed. And now we have administration that is basically just looking for a Reichstag fire to invalidate the elections. It's creeping up. And everybody who's listening to me, if you live within 100 miles of anywhere on the U.S. border, then you need to understand. This is one of the reasons why when federal officers showed up in Portland, Oregon, they were Department of Homeland Security federal officers, Border Patrol, because they can ignore the Fourth Amendment. 67% of Americans live in that area. And if you're some reason you live in a red state or a red city and you're like, hey, I'm in Alabama, this doesn't apply to me. You couldn't be more wrong. Anyway, that's, that's it. say to us, oh, they've got Antifa coming out in trucks, and we've got to be ready with their long guns. And since we did not fulfill that prophecy, since we did not jump in the trucks and drive out to uh, Gold Bar or their little towns, they came into a town, a city, 600 cars with Trump flags shooting paintballs at kids like you. I'm a 66 year old man, so I plan to be home in bed in about an hour, seriously. <laughs> but you kids, you people out here uh, demonstrating, no matter how peaceful you are, these people will infiltrate the crowd. I remember the March on Washington, 1972, where they rounded up 10,000 of us and put us in the Redskin practice field and beat the hell out of Abby Hoffman in front of us just to show us that they could do it. And I'm going to tell you right now that the bars are already off. These guys, they don't care anymore. They think that they have a mandate. And that mandate is to bring about what the woman had just spoke about, a fascist America. Do you think that you're, if you think for one minute, if you think for one minute that the economy is, is like bad and, and maybe this will go away and we'll get our jobs back and we'll all go back to work, 
Wall Street is booming. Even as we speak, Wall Street is booming. Trump is their puppet. This is the man that they have waited for years to put into office. And they are making money hand over fist right now. And you're wondering how. And yet they sit here and they scream, oh my God, you're destroying small business. They've already destroyed small business. They took small business away from us. They forced people, entrepreneurs, I mean, I'm not talking about the entrepreneur who came up with the new app or the new program, the golden boy sitting down in Silicon Valley. I'm not talking about that guy. I'm talking about me, you, the lady over there selling t-shirts, the kid up the street who just came up with a new whatever. Those people, those people, there is no, they, they have taken all of that. They monetize everything. You can't even, you know, a telephone cost you a phone. And believe me, you can't live without a phone. $1,000, where are you gonna get that? You go into debt forever. The social compact has been for so many years to redline against black people, to force black people to the bottom. But wait a minute, if you are white, or you are Hispanic, or you are Asian, take a look at the person standing next to you in the broke line. That's a black person, but it's also a white person. It's also an Asian person. It's also a Hispanic person. This system has been built on top of us, on top of all of us. And we have all been so busy pointing our fingers at each other and poking at each other. Well, right now, right now, we have a chance because the anger is palpable. We all feel it. We all feel the yoke on us now. And it's now for time for all of us to stand up together. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I can say, oh, Let's all go out and vote. But I want you to do that. I want you all to go out and vote, to work for other people and make sure that everybody votes and make sure that we have a polling place that's open. Because believe you me, I do not believe that Joe Biden is a progressive. I do not for one minute. I get pissed every time I hear them talk about Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie, or someone, and say, that's the squad. Oh, the squad, the squad. You bet your ass that's our squad. We need to get real progressives into office. Right now. But I'm gonna tell you, we need a stone to step on to get up there. Because we don't have that now. We don't have that now. And we need to put Biden and Harris into office so that we can have somebody, at least we can walk up to the White House. The White House is built like a fortress right now. You can't even get to it. At least we can walk to the halls of Congress and we can ask those people to say, look, you guys have got to move forward. Bernie was right. I'm not, and I'm not even a Bernie bro. I'm not, but he was right. My God. If one of us gets sick tonight, if one of us is unhealthy tonight, if one of our parents or our friends or our kids or our neighbors get sick tonight, they do not have health care in this country. And Obamacare was just a, uh, whatever. Yeah, we're gonna give you some health care. At least it was better than nothing. We could have built on that. We could have built on that. We've got people sitting out in small town America voting against their own best interest. Why, we do not know, but yes we do. Because they've made it into a racial argument. Truth. right. And that's, that's part of that division. That's part of what divides you from me 
when I walk into stores, like people are saying like, oh, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. Yes, they do for some of us, but for some of us, I'm just gonna walk back into the same stores, the, the same markets that I used to walk into where people would be going, oh my God, you know? And I'd have guys following me around. I expect that to start happening again when they can calm us down. But here's the thing, we have got to stay together. We have got to ally with each other. We have got to get in there and make sure that this fascist, because I've heard it said here tonight, I'll say it again, fascist regime. They're gonna call a socialist? Okay, yeah, I'm a socialist. I want health care for all. I want, a, a, I want a, a guaranteed income. I think that we should have a, a, gar a guaranteed minimum income. Really, I do, because quite frankly, they're using it in Canada right now and they're not having problems. Not the same problems we're having here. I don't want to listen to any more senators scream about like $600 is more money than I could, than, the, than you know, if, you, if I give you $600, you're not going to go back to work? What kind of crap is that? They make $174,000 and those sons of bitches have not been to work in a month. True. $174,000 a year. And they haven't been to work in a month. Where are they? Where are they right now? Not getting up our stimulus. That's right, exactly. They don't give a damn about your stimulus. They don't want you to have that stimulus. And yet they're wondering why you're upset, why you're hurt. Look, I could sit here and tell you stories about the Seattle Police Department that would curl your hair. I could tell you about them taking my car away from me on the Aurora Bridge. I could tell you about the night that they gave me five tickets in five minutes. I could tell you about the cop on the motorcycle who rolled up on me down on, 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 uh, <laughs> sorry, on Fifth Avenue. He rolled up on me. He said, what are you doing here, nigger? I thought, I mean, I could tell you those stories, but you know, those are just stories. We're living a life right now. We're living a life that, you know, those guys up there in their, in their Fort Apache sort of, oh, we have to put stones up here. We're so afraid of you. We're so afraid of you. If, you, if, if, if they came down here right now, all they'd have to do is open one, tent, one gas bomb and the, the, they could call it a riot. And the news media on television here just goes along with it. And they could arrest us, they can roll up here, and, or the thing that they're doing now, they're, they're getting the good citizens to roll into town. We've got problems coming our way. We're just gonna have to figure out how to stand up and face them together. Yes. Together. I want to thank you for listening to me.
here in a small village, Hohe. Y'all may never heard of that, H-O-H-O-E, Hohe. And they're Awe people, they're minority. So I'm driving from a minority tribe to a minority tribe. The Ashantis in uh, Ghana are the majority people. But my people, that all the people I know in Ghana are Awe. So they're very interested in this here, very interested. And you know, it's something really interesting. Uh, Y'all may not know this, but 2019, Ghana announced the year of return. The year of return is because the federal government of Ghana realized, you know what, we've been counting, we keep counting, 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 counting. It just hit us. 2019 is 400 years since the first slave ship left here. 400 years ago. Um, first of all, the Portuguese, I think, were in charge of the slaves, uh, the slave trade, uh, the transatlantic trade, slave trade in Ghana. Um, Ghana used to be called the Gold Coast until the slavers took all their gold, right? We used to have the Ivory Coast, the Gold Coast, until, and the slavers took all their gold. Now, the Portuguese, they were bad slavers. But the British perfected it. The British perfected it. And they were there the longest. One of the things I saw while I was there, uh, the Year of Return invited all African progeny to come home and see where their people last left the continent. It's not entirely true. Um, some people left from the Ivory Coast. There are different locations. But the main part of slaves that made it to America are progeny left Ghana um, and I, I went to one of the castles there it's fascinating if you if you my name is Nikki Blake Terry Fitz I'm on Facebook if you friend I'll friend anybody I only have a few slot, slots left so if you friend me you'll see my slave castle pictures and video um, at a certain point in time you walk into the dungeons and they say look right there that kind of flooring I want you the, the tour guides are telling you, I want you to memorize what that looks like. So he trained us in all his tours to walk around. I see a little bit of it. I see a little bit of it. It's not everywhere in some places. So he said, at the end of the tour, near the middle, he says, um, the University of Ghana came to rebuild some of this stuff because it was getting dangerous. One of the things they did was they said, what's this flooring? We can't reconstruct this flooring. We've never, it's antique and we don't know what it is. So they took it back to the lab at the University of Ghana. Guess what they found out? People started weeping, weeping. What it was, is there was originally a gutter that ran downhill from the slave dungeons to the ocean with my poor bear's poo and tea, right? But apparently the people that took care of the slaves didn't want to touch Negro poo, so they let the stuff clog up for hundreds of years. What they found out at the University of Ghana is what we were stepping on was flooring it was beautiful. It was beautiful stuff. We're like, what is that? We've never seen. It was the petrified feces, blood, and urine of our forebears, which meant that people were eating, sleeping on their own feces for 400 years. 400 years. They said it was this thick in some places. They were saying that it was never dry. It was always wet. The whole floor of the dungeons were wet with feces, blood, and urine. Now, when I um, when I was crying about that, it's dark in these dungeons, right? It's lighted because it's a museum now, right? But sometimes they turn off the lights and make you stand there in the dark. You're like, oh, my God. Oh. So you're standing in the dark. 
and uh, thinking about your forebears petrified too becoming floor tiles is what I was doing. But I took some art appreciation classes in college and something hit me. I was like, wait! And I realized the same time they were treating us like that, we didn't have a bedding. We slept with no covers on the floor made of our own poo. They were treating their own dogs like babies. If you ever go into a museum that has oil paintings from the time, there might be an entire room. I'm from, I'm from Chicago, so I'm, I'm used to the Chicago uh, museums. They're not, they're not, not this, not Sam type, um, but antique museums. You'll see rooms and rooms of rooms of paintings where they show oil paintings with nothing but feel and a beautiful dog that gets his coat brushed every day, right? And a whole hand dog has a house that looks like a mansion. It's amazing. This is at the same time they are allowing my people to sleep on slick floors made of their own excrement. And so you got to wonder. But my people, God, I want you to know they think we're one people. Many of them are too poor to help us over here, but they want you to know they care. We're, they're, we're trying to get the news out over there that we're pan-Africanism is what we need to have happen right now. It's something Malcolm X talked about, and we're all one people. Western Africans think that the Jamaicans who were sick down there originally for the for the sugar trade, right? Sugar down there, they're, they're a big sugar king. Uh, Jamaicans, Americans, uh, all the island people, and West Africans, we're all the same people. We're all the same people. Um, but Ghana won't let me, fl or they, they just opened up their borders, but I was really scared because Ghana had dropped the border between America and Ghana right after they made the most amazing tourism thing ever since the Crusades. Apparently, they made billions of dollars of Americans coming down to see the slave trade in Ghana. So they just made this network, they're excited, we're all, you know, American business people, I'm planning on um, opening businesses there, they want to open business here, they want to make the connection between black Americans and black Africans stronger, because now we run Ghana, we run Ghana, it's ours, it's the strongest democracy in West Africa right now. But, so they made this great thing, they got us all to come over. Beyonce was there, President um, Obama's been, and his wife has been there, there's a plaque about it. Um, but celebrity blacks went, they partied hard on New Year's Eve 2019. So I was there, I couldn't afford the big party with Dick Beyonce, but I was there. But, um, they made that, and then March, COVID right? COVID hit. So they started the networking, but they can't follow through on it. They blocked the borders. I have a plane ticket if I can't go. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to work dice on the border situation. Why is Ghana blocking the borders with America when so, they so badly need tourism money? When they have so many financial problems in Ghana. I'll tell you why. Ghana has COVID under control. Correct. Ghana, let me say that again. Ghana, Ghana has COVID under control. Ghana ain't got no world-class scientists, not one. Not a single one. You know what they did? Wore their masks. They wore their masks. So God closed the border, I assume. I'm going to make a guess. I'm not a diplomat, but I would have done the same thing. If Americans won't wear their mask at home, well, they're going to wear them in a third world nation. And then, if they try to block non-mask wearing Americans, they create an international situation. So they got to watch it. 
So that to me is how the proof is that we're lobsters in a pot that don't even know that we're boiling yet, right? If a third world nation that seriously needs our tourist money won't allow us to come after they created the hugest tourist income stream since the Crusades, does America not know we're in trouble when a third world nation that needs our tourist dollar says, no, you cannot come? Do they not know? I know. I mean, I, do they? You know they don't. People don't read. Does the president know where God is? <laughs> I don't know. But, he, but we're, well, there's a seriously close connection between black Americans and Ghana. There always has been. Whites go to Kenya. We go to Ghana. We go to Ghana. I mean, it's a place where all the ancestors are. Um, so we got trouble with Africa. So where else do we have trouble? Trouble, let's see. I was in New Orleans in 2017. I stayed at a hostel with a bunch of kids. You know, I was the oldest person there. I was granny. They drink hard in New Orleans. I was a little surprised. I mean, like, in the hospital, they started serving cocktails about 9 a.m. <laughs> with, our, with our international dish breakfast. I was like, really? Yeah. You want to drink? Yeah, I want to drink. 9 a.m. in the middle of the Trump administration? Shit, yeah. I'll take five. So... I actually ultimately left New Orleans. I said, you know, I better get out of here. They're turning me alcoholic. I better get out of here. Um, but I remember one night, I was hanging out with these European kids. They thought it was funny to have Granny with them going out to the to the Bur to Bourbon Street. Anyway, I was hanging out with these kids, and some locals had told us, no, no, they don't care so much. It's like not. We are here for your pleasure. If you go down to the AMP and Mini Mart and get you some cheap beer, then you can buy one beer at the bar and then keep the cheap beer in your pocket. I was like, oh Lord. Okay, so we, the kids want to go down to the AMP and Mini Mart. So I go out to the AMP and Mini Mart and get some cheap beer. When we left, these are all European kids. When we left, one of the kids looked at me and said, Nikki, why, why is it that? They watched us the whole time. I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed. I said, it's because of me, because you had a black in your group. Because you never know when this nigga's going to steal something. He said, you're kidding. He laughed. He said, you're kidding, right? He said, you're, you're a retired lawyer. I said, don't matter. Do you know who Janet Samuel Jackson is? He had, they had him eating L.A. LA uh, pavement one time in the middle of the uh, I-5, I think. And he, they asked him, he shouted out, he said, he's down on the ground like this, right? They asked him, he asked the cops, he says, do you know who I am? They said, we know who you are, Mr. Jackson, we just don't care, right? We don't, it doesn't matter how much money you make, how old you are. They didn't care that I was a 54-year-old, middle-class, middle-aged, black lady. I was still a nigga who might steal something from the convenience store. Right? Could I ask, is there a person? I'm sorry, my allies. I'm sorry, my allies. I don't want to pick on you because I'm glad you're here. I love you all, every single one of you. Are there any allies here who have been in a convenience store who uh, were trying to make a purchase, but it seemed like somebody was tailing them the whole time? Just raise your hand! Raise your hand. Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. I think I was about 20. 20? And I was talking to a and I had a... Ah, uh, yeah. They knew you long hair, didn't they? Okay, let me ask you this. Who? 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 So I'm so, uh, when this happened to me, I was 50 years old. The other woman talking is very hard for me to hear. Okay. Okay. I bet it's true. Young people do get harassed regardless of age, but disproportionately us, I believe. 
Is there anyone here who likes to say something else? I'll say something. I'll grab a little bit of brain So, on Twitter, there's a little report that there's an undercover car going around. And we all know that car car, they might have figured for protests that you don't have clock, but still be careful because they have been hunting recently for protesters that have been on my cell phone, leaving groups. If you don't feel like, you know, if you don't feel kind of fully alone, just that's why. It's usually it's like a gray, some kind of gray vehicle, there's also a black, a black suburban, just that's why. Also, regarding the whole being, being like what uh, Nikki said, um, also, you realize that basically, um, if you, ever, if you ever go to my my uh, my uh, my uh, fiance, when we go to the Safeway up on Queen Anne, and my mom don't, and my mom has a wife knowing this too, because my dad's technically black. It's a certain story. Basically, if I know one thing about Safeway, is the Safeway profiles you when we walk through the store. It's like, no, he's gonna steal something. I'm like, why the fuck do you have to be rude to somebody that's trying to buy things from your store? Everyone has a right to go to the store and not be profiled. We're all gonna buy the same thing. We're all gonna do the same thing. We're all there to buy stuff. You know? So, you know. Anyway, we'll let it back to you, Nikki. I just say one last thing, everybody. I want you to remember my brother and his son. Jacob Blake got shot. And I like I like to say hashtag seven in the back, seven in the back. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here today, because some white police officers, not all of them, but the system is corrupt. So if you're good, you don't say shit, right? Because then you get iced out. Truth. Some white police officers are so scared of black men that they kill them seven times, not just once, seven seven times in the back. And I would say, what kind of family has this guy grown up in that he's so scared of black guys that he's got to shoot a 29-year-old seven times when his kids are in the back seat, headed to their birthday, one of boys' birthday celebration. How scared must you be? How scared? How did your parents raise you to make you so scared of a 29-year-old with his back to you? How scared? Must you be? What our allies are going to do is they're not going to raise our, their children to be scared of my children. What they're going to do is any bigots in their family, they're going to cloister their children from there. Oh, I love you, Uncle Charlie, because you were always there for me. And you know, before your alcoholism and your crazy mental health breakdown, we were all cool. Because you put that stuff in here. But now that it's out here, I can't allow you to expose my children to it because someday your kid might grow up to be a cop and kill my kid. Thank you. That was Nikki Blake Shavitz who is the aunt of Jacob Blake from Kenosha, Wisconsin. She lives in Auburn, Washington. She is a retired attorney. And I believe she said a retired prosecutor, prosecuting attorney at one point, if I remember correctly from the beginning. We may have a opportunity here. Uh, don't leave. We may have something big coming up. And so I'm going to mute the microphone right now, but don't leave. Thank you so much for your time. Can you get a Do you mind asking me to bring you up? Nice. Um, what brings me out? I'm a 
the bus. He's a cute guy. AJ, oh. he was the, <laughs> the cute guy who came from my house. Yeah, AJ, he was, yeah, yeah, he did that Zoom call in my apartment. Yeah. We need to put that on AJ's resume. I know. <laughs> it seems to me that I could not have stayed home. I have a certain uh, hopelessness that anything can change, but it's not the most that we don't keep on. My son um, has hope. He has this tight back that when the, the uh, city hall rally went out, people uh, thought he was fine. He says, Mom, it's okay, Mom, but you don't want to see your kids life threatened, right? He said, Kids his age know that um, if you put up a picture of puppies, somebody's going to say something nasty about it. That seems to me a little bit different from hundreds of thousands of trombies um, criticizing and threatening your wife because you have the nerve to speak out. Um, they're critical of me, of everything, from how I look, from being cat, to being ugly, to being a crazy vile bigot, crazy vile racist. One of the things that was so funny to me is that the passion is what they're mad about. The passion makes you crazy. And I thought to myself, the anger makes a person crazy. Anger makes them crazy because, uh, but then I stopped and I thought, I remembered. I remember Howard Dean. That's what I remember. I'm a poli sci major and an administrative law um, specialist. And, uh, or that was my background in college. And it was fascinating when Howard Dean, Howard Dean believes he lost, and he was my man at the time, right? Do you remember? You're too young. You don't no, even know I'm what like, I'm talking about. I'm like about. trying to smile and understand screen? who. The Dean's the Green. Yes. There you go. Oh, yeah. So yes. what happened was at the at maybe a Democratic rally, his own rally, mm -hmm. Howard Dean goes, yes, like that, like, just like that. It was kind of lame screen. I thought, this guy doesn't watch sports, right? Yes, like that. It was really weird. It wasn't yet even the most passionate screen. It was a half-ass screen. But um, white America, I believe, is so unattached to their emotions. Apparently people who scream at rallies um, are considered unpresidential. And I'm like, but you have to know, black America, you're all too young to know this. This is a, a symbol of me um, rewinding my VCR. Y'all don't know What's that. a VCR? Yeah, that's I'm a VCR. VHI just... was came after VHS. But black people sat in America and we went rewound and we were like, what did he do? We didn't know. Because I come from a uh, of, I'm the daughter of a fiery Methodist minister, right? He screened every day, and that's what made the clay, the collection kit clay king. That's how I got fed, right? I heard it up there, yeah. Right, that's how, that's how black ministers act. And so I was just acting the way I act with, uh, it's like combination of, I come from a family of lawyers on one side and ministers on the other. So I... What an and, interesting dynamic right. for your family. So one of my friends, from, one of my uh, alum from high school, sent me an email and she said I loved your sermon I was like well hmm, that's interesting so but then we go online and they're like oh she's crazy she's crazy she's a crazy vile bigot she's crazy but when I looked to see what they thought was crazy it was the anger the passion and so are you I, surprised by um, protest culture now yes happily surprised happily surprised because I just generally believe that um, if Black Lives Matter was still predominantly black, we wouldn't be getting anywhere. When the white kids came in, I feel maybe we'll get somewhere. It's just like David Hogg is my personal hero. If I ever get to meet somebody, I'm not a celebrity person. I don't give a shit about celebrity. But David Hogg stood up to a senator and he wasn't even graduated from high school. And he said, are you going to keep taking money from the NRA? That's what I knew. The next generation is the only generation can save us from this. He, why hadn't I done it? I immediately, I was happy. Then I broke down into tears. Why didn't I ask Senator Cruz? 
Why wasn't I? Why wasn't it one of us? They scared us. That's why. And also, I think the kids don't know, you know, they shot King, they shot X, they shot, shot Kennedy, they shot Kennedy. I think my generation is scared to have um, a fiery demagogue or personality as strong as Trump is, because we'd be dead already. What's it like to see so many people come out to support you, to support your family, even though they're so many miles away from where this happened? I'm very happy about it, because I need for the country to know Black America is a culture that spans from sea to shining sea. From Baja, California to BC, uh, from uh, Florida to Quebec. After we, everything that's happened, do you feel that America is starting to get this message or still no? This, are, this happened after, after George Floyd. I thought they got it then. No, I don't think they got it. And um, getting it isn't the problem. Like I said, the people who were on the, um, the comments said they couldn't um, focus on my message because my, my face mask was too colorful. They, so the truth is that they don't want to focus on the message period. The message is not the issue. So we're going to have to find a way to end run them. And I don't know what that's going to mean, but I do think, Mr. Curry, get your get your LA people together who have money and Oscars and figure out how to do it. Get together with the smartest people in the nation. Figure out how you stop cops from shooting people for no reason. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad now. I think I've made you sit in the rain. For it's okay. I, I'm, not, I'm fine. Like I don't have a problem. Fifteen with minutes longer. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. It's starting actually to rain pretty hard here. You know that's the next step. Hello, sir. Hello. You? This is Malcontent Tango. He's Hi, the one. Hello. Oh, been How are you? Yeah, I know. You get the COVID elbow. Oh, okay. Us old stir. I know what a VCR oh, is. Prince Charles said, <laughs> <I'm a stay."> <laughs> <laughs> First of all, let me have a seat. Yes, sir. If that's all, oh, please don't call me, sir. I'm a, I'm a retired lawyer. We can't say. Thank you. <laughs> he knows I think oh, he's I know. cute. Oh, I know. Okay. So I want to start, first yes. of all, mm -hmm. your your weight loss journey. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Congra and um, yes, 65. congratulations. Thank 65 you. pounds. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. That's really significant. Mm -hmm. So. And I appreciate you giving me a little bit of time. And no I, it is raining hard, so I want to be respectful no, no. of your time. You all don't know. See, Seattleites are the biggest weather complainers ever. I'm from Chicago. This is spit. <laughs> y'all don't know. No, I'm good. Y'all don't know from rain. All Go right. ahead. Then we'll just sit out here. Yeah, I'm fine. Talk. I'm fine. Why don't you, um, because there's probably some people, because we've been live streaming the whole thing. So why, don't, why don't we start? I know you've introduced yourself earlier with like a little bit about your background you and your connection. Are you a Facebook friend of mine? Uh, very well could be. Okay. Are you a Facebook friend of Victoria's? Uh, definitely. Okay, we'll figure that out. Okay. okay. So could you tell me a little bit and tell my viewers just a little bit about your background and your connection with uh, Jacob Blake? So we're going to kind of go back yeah, to the very fine. beginning, that's right? Yeah, that's fine. My brother is um, a civil rights warrior in the Midwest. My father was a civil rights warrior in the Midwest. They had the same name. This boy has my grandfather and my, my brother's name, Jacob Stephan Blake. Um, he is, uh, there's a schism in my family. I ha don't know him very well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, we hope that this is gonna bring us back together. So um, Donald Trump says he's planning to come to Kenosha on Tuesday. That I makes my stomach hurt so much. I read um, right as you were going here that the governor of Minnesota has asked him to please reconsider. Thank along, you. Along with Thank some you. other officials. Mm -hmm. What is your what is your view on this? My I don't know. Did were the um, were the Portland kids ever uh, returned home? Didn't he disappear some Portland kids? Did they ever oh, make yes, it home? Yes, yes, yes. So you're talking about the people in the yeah. vans. That, so I'm yes. scared that they're going to disappear kids. That's what I'm scared. That BLM kids are going to be disappeared. That's my primary concern because these people are Nazis. I don't think they care about anybody. I mean, if I go to... I've been going to Chuck E. Cheese for years because my kid <laughs> likes Chuck E. Cheese from when he was this tall. Mm -hmm. 
So when I go into Chuck E. Cheese, I don't even think about the kid. I sit down, read my newspaper, um, play on my laptop, because I know I have a band and my kid has a band. If a kid runs towards us, they grab the kid yeah. and try to find the parent's band. There, I have been led to believe now through all this time that Mr. Trump did not even Chuck E. Cheese ban the kids who he took and put in the border camps, yeah, right? Right, so right, right. So it's preposterous. I mean, if they didn't want to get the kids back with their parents, maybe because Miss DeVoe's adoption agency needed more kids. Right. It's crazy. The whole thing is crazy. So when I say I'm scared and people are like, well, you're being unreasonably scared. No, I'm not being unreasonable. They've already disappeared the kids in uh, Portland and they've already not Chuck E. Cheese armband the kids that are in the concentration camps. People, good people, doctors have been, Christian doctors even, have been trying to get to the kids at the border to get them beds, toothpaste, toothbrushes, things that no child should be without right so not only have we taken their children can't give them back because we don't know who they are when they finally some of them get reunified with their parents they don't know who they are and they pull away from them so if you think that they care about any protesters you are wrong they do not care about anyone let's switch gears and let's talk mm -hmm. a little about auburn right there was mm -hmm. this public uh uh, a very a lot of publicity around Jeff Nelson. We don't have to call him Officer Jeff Nelson anymore. That's good and the to know. Jesse and the Jesse Saray case, mm -hmm. where uh, Jeff Nelson is now uh, looking Victoria, at Victoria. Come here. Who's now looking at second degree murder? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm talking about Auburn, and I want I don't have all the information. Oh, okay. No, I'm no, sorry. that's fine. That's fine. I've been in my own thing. I've had yeah. Some, yeah. But but you were talking about the issues with the Auburn Police yes, Department right. there, right? Um, and to give you a little bit of background, since in 11 years there have been five uh, police officer involved killings in yeah. the city of Auburn, 82,000 people. Which is amazing Three. since they they only have a skeletal staff. Yes, but, exactly. I mean, they're, how could they kill so many people? They're never there when you need them. And their skeletal hours are always on the weekend when you need a cop the most. Right, right. Yeah. And that's very true. Um, three of those were uh, Jeff Nelson. Uh, three oh, of, three of I those, did not three of those know five that. Were, and Jeff Nelson had 65 use of force yeah. incidents. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't wow. in 11 years with Jeff Nelson. That was in nine years that he had three. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, 65 use of forces. And he also uh, struck a suspect with his police cruiser, intentionally rammed somebody. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking a, a love tap. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking essentially mm -hmm. running mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. over. I, I, as somebody who's been a, what sounds like a longtime resident in Auburn, I mean, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that as a as a community and and the the, the issues that um, the Black, Indigenous, and person of colors uh, community uh, face there, right? Because there's a significant Indigenous population there, which as I don't think Victoria. a lot of people, right? A lot of people don't realize. I don't think. Yeah. Um, what's really interesting to me is that when the Pied Piper racism called out on his pipes from the White House. Apparently, a lot of stuff that had been under living under rocks for decades came out. I, for instance, have never had any racist incidents with um, Auburn police mm -hmm. or with my neighbors until um, it's always funny to me how the Sikhs ended up getting killed or harassed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's they're kind of like Texans. A Texan, not going to hide, he's a Texan. He's proud to be a Texan. <laughs> a Sikh never hides that they're Sikhs. Yes. You can look at them and see they're Sikhs unless you're ignorant, right? Right. If you see somebody and you consider the term raghead to be a racially defining term, then you think to yourself, oh, he's got a rag on his head. He must be Muslim. That's too exotic for me. So when I think it was 2000 and early 2017, um, some asshole tried to kill some mm -hmm. Sikh in, mm -hmm. in Kent, right? Yes. And that's the first time I had, I was in touch with the bigger protest community in many, many years, uh, after the Women's March, actually. I, I decided after the men, Women's March, I was too old to march anymore because I remember getting up to be the top of Beacon Hill. And I looked down on the sea of women, and I was more empowered than I'd ever been in my life. I was like, oh, my God. Then I looked to my husband. And I said, I can't walk up this hill no more. I'm done protesting. 
I'm one of the intelligent minds in this community. If they call me, I'll help, but I can't do this marching thing anymore. Um, but after that, this whole Sikh thing happened, and the Sikhs were really smart. Mm -hmm. They opened up a, a space, uh, it actually was a um, multi-faith situation, because I think the a Christian church was bigger than their gathering place, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think it was a Lutheran church in downtown Kent, allowed to come in there and show them our music, show, show the music, show the food. We are people, we are not targets. And I remember being there and feeling so happy that we need to keep supporting each other. And that's why I keep doing this, because I, not that I think protests really change things, but protests are the places where people network and young people who don't know the history of COINTELPRO, who don't know the history of the Panthers, who don't know mm -hmm. that Fran Hampton was shot in the back and his wife received an $8 million judgment, but it took 30 years. Kids need to be exposed to me because I have the knowledge. I need to be exposed to the kids because the kids have hope. Let's talk a little bit about Gen Z, and I think that'll, that'll probably be my last or second to the last question. Say it again. About Generation Z, the young kids. The yeah, young what kid, about right? The young. Well, I just you, you were praising yes. them early, right? You think that. What do you think has changed with with? with oh, the, I know exactly with, what it was. Okay. And if you get back to your place, I'll send you my kids' essay about it. Wonderful. One of the things um, that has happened that us adults don't know about, because the school districts kind of keep it secret, unless you're on the board or the PTA, you have no idea what your kid's gone through. One of the things that happened to my kid, and I had no idea, but I also worked like a litigator. I worked, you know, 15 hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't primary parent. I always said my retired husband was primary parent. So I didn't keep up with all this stuff. Only after my kid graduated did I come to know that he, a couple of times a year, had to go to single shooter drill. I think yeah. it's called yep. solo shooter, lone wolf drill. I don't know what they call it, but yep. solo they have shooter to do, drill. They have to do the yeah, uh, the, but they the, don't the, send the out a flyer to the parents and say, you know, be ready to emotionally support your kid because it's kind of secret. The, it's the nation's dirty secret mm -hmm. is that we are putting the burden of the Second Amendment on kids that just need to be studying algebra, right? Mm -hmm. So there, it's a hush, hush, hush. So only after my kid graduated, I guess he thought we knew. Did he say, Mom, you know, and he read something on my Facebook that was ignorant because I didn't know. And he said, Mom, you don't understand this issue at all. And I was like, well, tell me more. He wrote this whole essay. I distributed it. It's about how when he was in his Japanese class, I know his Japanese, I remember, she's a skinny little lady, a blonde lady, about knee-high to grasshopper. She says, I'm supposed to read this stuff to you. It's a single shooter stuff. And she got to the end and she says, it says here that if there's an issue, I'm supposed to, you know, be your body flag. And she said, I have to tell you, as a human being, I'm not sure that I'm going to do that. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. But when you're in those moments, those terrifying moments, Absolutely. you never know whether you're going to shit your pants. Um, be comatose. You don't know what kind of person you are until the situation happens. The kids, instead of being scared, they got together and they decided this is our plan. We can't rely on her. But that we've grown up knowing we might die in a class like this. We've been going through these shooter drills for years now. They made up a plan and my kid became my hero when he told me this this day. They decided to rush the door. Mm -hmm. They said some kids are going to die. They were going to die anyway. But if we all rush the door, some kids will live. And that's the day I realized why they're heroes. Because they never expected to live this long. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's it. David, I wanted to answer your question about what it was like being in Auburn. With yeah, the yeah, yeah. I've grown up there. What's yeah. your name? My name is Victoria Pacho. <laughs> and I've Lawyers been, always want to be in charge of everything. <laughs> I've been in Auburn since 1992. And as a young kid, like, I remember going to the park with my girlfriend and being escorted out um, by the police officers. And they only cuffed me, um, but not my white girlfriend. I remember cars, you know, as we cross our street, especially those of dark melanin and my black brothers and sisters 
cars will speed up. So what it's like being a person of color and growing up is you learn you have to keep your head down, that you should be quiet because everybody's looking at you and they don't want you there. And the cops aren't going to help you. I have heard from several community members how the cops have either gaslighted them, sided with the abuser, or sided with the person who was actually threatening their life. Um, and we have a, on the, on the reservation, there's a lot of, they hassle individuals there even more so. Um, you know, we have Renee, Renee Davis who, who, was, who, was, who was murdered. And it's really hard to hear much from their families and these things. And so it's important that the black community and the indigenous community work together, you know, brown and black together, um, and even supporting the allies. Be and, and also we need your help in Auburn. Um, sometimes when there's not a lot of action or there's not a lot of voices, that is a sign of the temperature and the, and the threat and the danger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right now, our police, you know, work with ICE agents. You know, we have we have ICE in our community threatening them all the time, um, and and the police are are constantly threatening. So the people of color in Auburn, we don't even have a dang park for the families and the kids to go and 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 and, and swing at. We have one for all of Auburn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you There's always learn really that uh, that you that you that you have to watch your back. And it's hard when you feel and you're told constantly with these microaggressions like you're too much, you're too loud, you, you need to be disciplined, you need to do these things to, to feel the agency to stand up and to, to utilize that voice. But we are learning and we're taking much of that learning from our younger individuals who have this autonomy in themselves. Right. And so they're teaching us how to use our voice. Well, why wasn't that? Why didn't I say something that day? Right. Um, I want to say too, Auburn um, government seems to have gone on over, just tipped on over to the dark side. I mean, um, I have, there are many Auburn pages, um, some run by government, some by, run by community on Facebook. I, I, I'm old, okay? Mm -hmm. I stick to Facebook. I know there's other things <laughs> out there, it's the Instapop, whatever, you know, I don't know the names, I'm old. but. Um, I stick to Facebook because that's where I was first. If it had been Twitter, I'd be at Twitter first. But because I am old and I don't want to learn no t new technology, I'm on Facebook. And there's lots of Auburn Facebook groups. I keep posting about the racist incidents that have occurred to me in Auburn. They keep dis disappearing. The mayor doesn't want to know. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to. They don't want to know. They don't want to do anything. It makes me think they're racist. Now I don't know the mayor. They just want you to shut up. Be they want you pretend right. You, they want you to be quiet about it. Suffer silently with your racism. So when one of my neighbors, um, whose house I've passed by hundreds, if not thousands, of times in the last 20 years of my child's life while I was losing weight, when they threaten to release their pit bull on my 54 year old self, mm -hmm. unfit self. What you were talking about right. earlier, I'm right? I'm like, really? Man? Rewind the stream if you want to hear that story. Right, right, right. <laughs> really, man? Really? You're going to release your dog? I mean, now, of course. They said, move it along. I'm like, I was moving it along, but now that you now that you want me to move along, I fe <laughs> my feet are feeling like concrete. Now, of course, that's how black people get shot. But the way right. I figure about it right now is I've had a long, blessed life. Really, I have. I've had the, had the McMansion I wanted. I had my kids. I have one kid here in Bush School that... Um, uh, I've made lots of money and let it all go through my fingertips, right? A lot of us Americans don't save a lot, and so I'm not, I'm not wealthy. Um, but I've had a lot of money, and I've spent a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. And my house is uh, as expensive as their house. So why do they think I'm a threat? Why do, I think I, why do they think I shouldn't be smelling their butterfly bush? Why do they think they should threaten to release their dogs on me? To me, it seems pretty obvious. I, so now when I walk by, I say, hi, bigots. <laughs> and I know that they're hearing me because they keep their window open, right. their, their kitchen window. Right. So yesterday I saw, I was on my walk a couple days ago, 
and there were uh, Mexican landscapers. And I said, how do you feel working for bigots? <laughs> and I, they didn't understand. I couldn't get in to understand. But when I walked past their house, I used to walk the, I used to make it walk a circle and end at their house. And my house is about three blocks away. Right, right. But I've started going to their house first because sometimes when I get home, it's late at night and I don't want to pass their house at at dark, dark, right? They've affected, they've changed the way I live by their bigotry. Um, Mm. It's, and you don't want them to change you, but you have to be careful, you have to be safe. Um, And I thought to myself, I'm going to hate, I'm going to, put hand flyers in all their na- everybody within a block to each side I want to make sure everybody knows and my neighbor says you know what if your neighbor one of my one of my friends says what if your neighbors don't support you and you end up being one of the dead ones and I said that's a good point I live in Auburn it take a long time for the sorry ass Auburn police especially if it was a skeletal day a skeletal staff day to get up and even find my body right right so I did. I haven't at this point done anything about it. But if anybody wants to ask me their address, I will let you know, so <laughs> you can avoid that house if you are people of color. Last question. Mm-hmm. It feels to many, many of my viewers, I should say, that we are kind of on the precipice. We heard some speakers talk about this also. Um, we've had the terrible incidents that have happened in Kenosha. Um, both with uh, your nephew and then the violence that followed after that. We had a protester killed in Portland last night. Um, we were watching multiple streams tonight as a, as a news organization, um, and we noticed that literally every uh, every uh, protest that we saw, um, there were guns at today mm-hmm. on both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we step back from this precipice mm-hmm. in your view? My family have been nonviolent activists since the 60s. My father ate at the White House for changing my town from a segregated town into an integrated town just in time for me to go to a non-Jim Crow kindergarten. My family, I have watched them over and over again say, please do not have violent protest in our family's name. That's all we can do about our family. I do believe that just like I told you, my kid was willing to throw his body against a single shooter to possibly protect it. And they've already thought they're smart kids. They said, you know, some kids aren't going to be able to move. And they said, but that's why we're going to be the ones that do move. He obtained a pact from six of his closest friends that they would move. Mm -hmm. So if there's 30 kids in the class, they committed to be those six kids that would throw their bodies at these jerks. 20%. Yeah. And so um, what I think you're looking at when you see a white kid killed in protest is these same kids saying, somebody's got to die. Let it be me. They're very sacrificial because they've always known that they could die while they were in algebra class. So they're like, I'm surprised I'm still alive. They're really, they need a lot of therapy. I mean, the, the kid, I, I'm surrounded by 20 year olds because my kid's a Dungeons and Dragons player. They're <laughs> over at the house. We're, we're black geeks, right? So they're over at the house. Some people don't know there are black geeks, but there are black geeks. They're over at the house, you know. And so I get to talk to 20-somethings a lot. They're surprised they're still alive. And so these ones who are taking the bullets, I know they think they're taking it as a martyr so that their bodies can be used as symbols for the future. That's what I suspect. And it's a very sad thing. I mean... Um, as a lawyer, I know that there's only one amendment that can cause you, other people to lose all of the other amendments, 1 through 27, right? And that's the second amendment. Mm-hmm. That means that we've got to do something about that. Something. 
Um, what I would prefer really is, I mean, financial. I mean, I think that if you have to be licensed to drive a car, you should be licensed to carry. And if you have to be licensed to drive a car, you should be, I'm sorry, if you should be insured to li drive a car, you should be insured to carry by a lot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by at least as much as my um, comprehensive insurance on a nice sedan, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, I have mm -hmm. a nice sedan. It, there should be a, at least as much as the comprehensive insurance mm -hmm. on a good sedan. Because what happens is you see these guys, smirk ass faces, they go out, they lose, right? They go to prison. And so they've gone to prison. I've got no kid. I don't even have money to bury my kid, right? The, the insurance policy should be at least enough to bury my kid, let alone for the love that I've lost for the next 20 years. That's it. Nikki, this has been an amazing conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Vicki, thank you for reaching out to us no uh, and setting this up. Very much appreciated also. Thank you. And uh, I know you're you're waiting so patiently for your turn. And I actually just have one question and, and I'm going to I'm going to ask Yeah, you and I'm going to close yeah. out my stream so I'll be done up by then. Yeah. All right, let me uh, flip the camera around here. So you're not looking at a bush, but you're looking at me. Or not. <laughs> you're looking at my hands. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, my, <laughs> my mask was creeping up on my face the whole time I was doing that. Um, there you go, Malcontents. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was uh, Nikki Blake Shavitz, who is the aunt of Jacob Blake, uh, the individual who was shot seven times in the back uh, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, by the Kenosha police. And we had a opportunity uh, to uh, give an interview with her after uh, she spoke today. Um, and so with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I hope you really appreciated um, the journalism that we provided today. Uh, you know, we, uh, I had said earlier this week that there's going to be kind of a shift um, and we're going to be trying to do more journalistic work. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be doing protests anymore. Um, but uh, I think in the long run, I think that's kind of, we're going to have a, <laughs> it's creeping up. That's going to be a better way that we can serve the community. And so with that, I want to say again, thank you. Um, it's pouring down rain. I think I, you probably can kind of see some of the drops in the background and stuff. It's utterly pouring. I really don't mind the rain. Um, but uh, I'm going to wrap it up normally. And the other thing is, is I don't have a free hand. I'm holding my mic. I'm holding the mic and I'm holding and I'm holding the phone because I took it off the pole and I just don't have a free ad. So with that, Malcontents, thank you so much. If you liked this, if you really appreciated the interview part, like, share, uh, like the page, follow the page. That's uh, how we get the word out. Malcontent. <laughs>